So I'd like to talk about sort of basic behavior of PN junctions, but in particular what happens in terms of some of the carriers and the carrier dynamics. Now we talk about PN junction devices, and a few things are very are rel are tend to be important. One is we know that there's a band diagram, both and we can see that there's a shift from the conduction band to the valence, from the conduction band here and on the valence band between the two spaces from the P type region to the N type region. You know that in a zero bias case, there's no voltage across here because there's a single Fermi level. You know this is the P side because after all, there the Fermi level is near the valence band. And so that means you're going to have far more holes than electrons. On the other side, you know this is N type because you this is close to the conduction band, and therefore you know that you have far more electrons than you do holes. And in fact, that difference in doping, the difference between the majority from the number of electrons you have or electron carriers you have on this side to the level on this side, that ratio turns out to be related to the built-in potential voltage. Um, there's another way to frame it, which is going to be UT times these elements in the in, in the in the ratio. Notice that that would be ND over what is the number of carriers on the P side, which is going to be NA over NI squared. So this gives you the sense of the built-in potential. Now what we're going to get though is we're going to get both diffusion of carriers that can go that can be high enough higher than the barrier and those can go from this side to this side and then any electrons that can come on, on this can get to the edge, they can drift across. There's obviously diffusion in the two regions here and here. Same thing is true for the holes. The holes, anything that's in this that are minority carriers have the chance if they can to drift across and anything over here that's at a high enough energy has the ability to diffuse from the P side to the N side. Interesting thing though that you get an equilibrium that's set up where there's a balance between the drift and the diffusion. And this is diffusion over the electrostatic barrier. And it's important that that barrier sits there. Because if that barrier was too low, then I would start getting diffusion of a lot more carriers across. But what would happen if I had diffused more carriers across over here? Well, that would then make this more negative, which would effectively, of course, it also makes this more positive, which would effectively then, which would effectively then raise the barrier. Remember, we're talking about positive electron potential. So that eventually, there's a point there. Well, imagine if the barrier is too high. I mean, there's not enough diffusion, and there's only drift of carriers across. Well, what's going to happen? Well, this potential will be less negative. This this band will drop some, and eventually we'll reach an equilibrium. So there's a stable equilibrium that is generated by this. And that's good. It's good that it's stable. If it wasn't, we'd have a problem. So we often then talk about, OK, I've got a PN junction device, and I have no bias across it. And I might describe it this way. And it gives me a nice band diagram like this. What happens when I forward bias it? Right? Because this was the nice, simple case of no bias, no bias. What happens? Well, what happens is that effectively for the N material and the P material, their effective Fermi levels move. Now, if you're being really rigorous, you're always going to say, anytime you have more than one Fermi level, it's not equilibrium on and on and on. Fine. We're going to get to that in a moment. But at least locally, there's clearly a Fermi level. And the Fermi level is actually what you make a contact to. That's what, oh, that's what actually, when you actually put metal, you actually contact with the Fermi level. And so that's why when you look at this structure, it's flat. There's zero potential. Of course, also it turns out to be zero current because of the way the equilibrium works. Here, the difference in the Fermi levels is actually related to the applied voltage. And that turns out to be kind of important because what I've effectively done is I've applied voltage to this, which has taken this barrier here of a certain size, and I've shrunk the barrier. Remember, in terms of shrinking the barrier, that means I've got more carriers that can diffuse across. And it's an exponentially more current carriers because the barrier has decreased by an exponential amount. And that changes things. Now, we talked about when you have carrier transport, you don't get a Fermi level. Well, the other thing that comes out of that is that, you know, in a in a case where the carriers are different, 
um, you know, Fermi level is great, but it only, you know, it's only useful, right, when there's no um, disturbance. So one of the things we end up talking about is what is a quasi-Fermi level, the F sub n and F sub p, to kind of say, well, for the electrons and holes, what would that actually look like? And that sounds like a hand wave until you realize that it actually is kind of, it actually does connect to the actual Fermi level itself, and is fundamentally where a lot of things directly would connect to if they had the chance. So it's a little bit, so it's actually somewhat more important um, than just sort of an interesting intellectual hack. Uh, and so always important to notice that. So for like the electrons, it's pretty much going to, you know, be relatively flat and then fall off as I down to the Fermi level here on the p-type material. This, by the way, represents the fact that there is some exponential decrease over, you know, over space. And this is kind of known in how we solve this. The same sort of thing happens on the p-side. In reverse bias, what have I done? Well, in forward bias, I've made the barrier smaller. In reverse bias, I've made the barrier larger. Ah, so now it means that the diffusion almost goes away, and all I'm left with is just the um, drift transport down. By the way, this is why you always look at, at your IV relationships as e to the v over ut minus 1. Well, it's this it's this reverse bias region where I'm getting that minus one part of the property. It's here is where I'm getting the e to the v over ut part of the property. But it's kind of important to be able to see the band picture of this and get get a picture of this because at some point, you know, you eventually just start getting into equations, you start getting to sort of be able to see the band picture and, and build. But knowing what's actually happening underneath is very, very helpful to getting confidence of what you're going to do in these various situations.